Sit back there, lads, and let me tell you a story. This is a story not about military daring or even about a tank. It is a story about a factory and its attempt to build a tank. It is a boring story, and should my YouTube analytics tool state that my audience retention for this video is hideous, I will in no way be surprised. However, for those of you who are curious about some of the things which go on to make a tank, the regional archives in Chicago have the stories of some of the local manufacturing plants. After all, we know that in World War II, the US was the great industrial powerhouse of the world. And when somebody said, build tanks, it was easy to create a new factory and then open the taps, swarming the enemies of the United Nations with Shermans and Stuarts and B-24s and whatever else it was that we decided we felt like building, right? If the experience of International Harvester is to go by, well, not necessarily. You see, they got the job of building the M7 medium tank. International Harvester was no fly-by-night company. It was a big name in its field and well-resourced. If you're not familiar with the M7 medium, don't be too surprised. They only built a baker's dozen of the things. The original intent was to build a light tank, the T7 come in at about 16 tons and to be a far superior tank to the Stuart. It would be about a foot longer, nearly two feet wider, have a crew of five with a three-man turret in a turret ring some 18 inches greater in diameter. A redesign later and it also proved to be lower than Stuart. Both the radial engine and the automatic transmission were mounted on rails for easy maintenance, much like on an M18. What's not to like? The gun, though, being a 37mm, was considered too weak, and so eventually we moved to a 57mm and then a 75mm, by which point the thing had gone up to 28 tons and didn't seem to do anything the Sherman couldn't do for about the same weight, so why bother? It had other problems as well. For example, the engineering report from early 1943 said repeatedly that the brakes don't work, no matter what they tried doing with them, but that's a story for another video. Actually, since an M7 does still exist, I last saw it in Aniston, I may even cover it one day. However, this is the story about what International Harvester went through to build the tank. The project was started February 1941 and Rock Island Arsenal was tasked to build a few pilots. Now, it's worth noting that the pilot light tank was actually constructed in January 42, which isn't actually all that long considering, not too bad. What is more interesting is that International Harvester had been told they were getting the contract to build the things in December 1941. So in other words, they were gearing up to build tanks that nobody knew if they actually worked. I've mentioned before in the Pershing saga that folks were getting a bit burned by ordnance making commitments and promises on vehicle capability which it turned out that they were unable to meet. This would prove to be one of those instances which caused the caution later in the war. On the other hand, Pearl Harbor had just happened a couple of weeks earlier, so perhaps a little bit of overreaction might be understandable. In any case, a temporary headquarters for the project staff was set up by International Harvester at the Farmall Works on Rock Island on New Year's Eve 1941, and a new factory immediately started construction across the river. If you're not familiar with the Quad Cities area, it's Moline and Rock Island on the Illinois side of the river, down south, Moline, Rock Island, and then Bettendorf and Davenport are on the Iowa side of the river. These days, they're basically all merged into one big town. The Rock Island Arsenal, where the pilot T7 tanks were being built, is the island in the middle of the river, split into two, pretty much at the intersection where all four towns meet and this would prove to be quite the advantage for International Harvester, as lots of things would be close to each other. The Farmall plant was literally across the river from Rock Island Arsenal, and a number of the other major subcontractors were in the area as well. As a result, if they were going to build a new factory for these new tanks anyway, why not just build it in the same area? So they did. They started the construction of the Quad Cities Tank Arsenal in Bettendorf, Iowa, just northeast of the Rock Island Arsenal, sorry, your perspective, north, east. 
Construction was very rapid. After all, the buildings are just shells. And operations were moved from Farmall to Bettendorf on the 11th of February, 1942. In the meantime, they also needed to figure out what they needed to build and how to build it. International Harvester was the prime contractor, but it didn't build everything. On New Year's Day 1942, Mr. E. H. Soner, the General Superintendent of International Harvester Works, went across the river to the buildings of French and Hecht, a wheel manufacturer found more or less where the Quad City Times building is today. It's about as close to the Rock Island Arsenal as it is possible to be in Davenport. Why did he go to a wheel manufacturer? To get wheels, of course. He wanted them to build the bogey and trailing idler wheels. Well, that was right in their wheelhouse, as it were. And by 14th of January, they wandered over the bridge to Rock Island Arsenal and had the designs approved. An order for five idlers and nine bogey wheels was placed on the 20th of January, which meant that French and Hecht had to get dies to make the things. These first wheels would be delivered on 20th of April. It takes time to spin things up, you see, even for a wheel manufacturer to build wheels. Other major subcontractors brought in on the project would include Standard Steel Spring Company of Allegan, Michigan, for armor plate, one piece top hulls from Orton's Steel Foundry in Rock Island, American Steel Factory and General Steel Castings Company, both in Granite City, Illinois, about 200 miles uh, further south near St. Louis, and American Steel uh, would also produce turrets. Tracks will come from Goodyear, Firestone, or Goodrich over in Akron, Ohio, or US rubber in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. The R975 engines would come from Continental up in Detroit, and various other international harvester subsidiaries would also get involved. The transmissions by their Milwaukee works, traversing gear by Richmond works, but the suspensions and final drives would be made locally in their Framal and East Moline works respectively. That just left Stabilizer from Westinghouse Electric in Pittsburgh and the Gun Mount. For that, on 3rd of February, International Harvester called the Linograph Company, which made typesetting machines, and asked if they might be interested. They said yes, so they got together. The Linograph building is a listed building a couple of blocks up the road from where French and Hecht were. If only Linograph knew then what they were to know later. It was considered beneficial that since typesetting machines required fine tolerances, they'd do well with the 37mm mount production. With all of these various companies getting involved, they even had to make arrangements so that the different companies would honor each other's identification badges, because they're all going around visiting. Anyway, while everyone was still setting the conditions for the construction of the tank, there were some very basic problems. For example, though Rock Island Arsenal was hard at work building a couple of pilots, they were doing so off the cuff, as it were. International Harvester would require plans and drawings. But by March 1942, of the estimated 3,300 drawings required, only 900 production drawings and about 1,800 informative prints had been issued. To help speed things along, International Harvester sent over some draftsmen to Rock Island Arsenal. However, it seems that somebody in Detroit noticed that Rock Island now had a lot of draftsmen on hand and poached the Rock Island guys to go work in Detroit, with the end result that the T7 production was no better off. The new tank evidently would require welders. So International Harvester set up a welding school in Farmall in March using two welding machines shipped in from East Moline. A good student was expected to qualify as a welder in six weeks. But they still needed something to weld. The factory was still an empty shell, remember, so they needed machine tools to fill it. These tools had to be ordered by 01 April so that they could be in the next quarter's schedules. Initially, the request was for 2,000 machine tools, but they later dropped it to 1,500. What could be made locally in the meantime, such as welding fixtures, well, they made them. The question of whether the hull of the vehicle would be made of a single casting or welded was not resolved until sometime in July, 
until International Harvester could ship a welded hull over for ordnance to shoot at and see whether or not it would pass tests. It did. Indeed, the welds from International Harvester were rated as excellent. Originally, International Harvester was not supposed to make the transmissions or final drives, but it became apparent that no sources were available for them. As a result, International Harvester would have to make them themselves, and they started making those two lines, as aforementioned Milwaukee and, I believe, uh, from. As time progressed, it became obvious that the schedule of production was not going to be met unless the machine tools showed up. It turned out that the priority and urgency ratings assigned to the project, or at least for the factory, were lower than every other tank contract at A1A and 384 respectively. Doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. The very first machine tool to show up was a radial drill on the 8th of April 1942, uh, but there was no sign of much else happening. At this point, everybody got together and traveled to Chicago to attend the Chicago Ordnance District Office to state the case that they needed tools. The district office suggested getting the Lloyd Committee on Machine Tools involved. As in many countries, the shortage of tools was probably the single biggest limitation of production in the US. The Depression had decreased production to about 10,000 units a year in the first half of the 1930s. By 1938, though, it had gone up to 34,000. Then suddenly, the rush was on. Machine tools were required by France, UK, and Russia, and in huge numbers. The tool manufacturing industry was saddled with old equipment. Now, over 85% of the machinery was over a decade old, and some even dated back to the Civil War. Yet a single factory such as Studebaker's required 13,000 machine tools. Tool manufacturing equipment needed to be built, and to run them, a new salvo of tool makers. Only then could the tools start being shipped to the factories to build war material, and to oversee this, well, that was the Lloyd Committee on Machine Tools. The Defense Plant Corporation, you know, basically a government of operation, semi-state body as it were, it built 35 new machine tool plants during the war. In 1939, the US built 300,000 machine tools, and that rate continued to increase. Anyway, it was May the 11th before a representative of the committee showed up at Quad Cities Arsenal, and after a couple of weeks of work, including a trip to Washington, D.C., he was still unable to obtain the tools. In the meantime, after working on the 37mm mount for a little over a month, Linograph was informed that, well, actually, we've decided we want the tank to have an English six-pounder, so you have to throw aside what you've done and start over. For whatever reason, the preliminary prints had to be secured from England, and Linograph tried starting to line up to make 57mm mounts instead. However, the blueprints weren't great, so on 5th of May, Linograph sent a bunch of engineers across the border to check out a Canadian factory which was building 57mm slash 6 pounder guns. After 10 days there, they returned not only with information for their own project, but also for the lads at Rock Island Arsenal across the river who were working on the American version of the gun. Of course, not only did they need to redesign everything, many of the toolings had been ordered for the 37mm and they were not suitable for production of the 57 New orders were placed with the same rapidity of success as earlier orders. And in the words of the report, quote, it was necessary to improvise and substitute methods to get anywhere at all, unquote. April 23rd, International Harvester Bettendorf places another order with French and Hecht, this for engine mounting rings. And then on 23rd of May, requested by International Harvester Farmall, the French and Hecht return roller was submitted to Rock Island Arsenal for testing. This was approved, and the order for return rollers was placed 10th of July, two weeks after the first five production bogey wheels and first two production idler wheels were delivered to International Harvester. The machine tools estimate from French and Hecht was submitted May 14th, which meant that they were too late for that quarter's estimates. The list of tools requested by them was not final until 1st of October. 
If you're wondering how all the stuff was being built in the meantime, it was using, quote, tool room methods, unquote, which is, as near as I can tell, basically handcraft building. The record notes that this was done at considerable cost higher than that from using machine tools. The hunt for tooling continued. Originally, there was an order out for Cincinnati Mills, uh, but they were not likely to show up until any time between late autumn to early spring. Come May, it was discovered that the Dean Machinery Company could furnish Betts vertical boring mills much sooner. I have no idea what the difference is between them, but the latter were much more expensive. Regardless, the price was paid and the first 78-inch mill showed up on the 8th of June with a 112-inch one not far behind it. I'm sure if some of you are into, into machine tools and engineering, you know what I'm talking about. I have no clue. Also, in late May, Rock Island finally get a T-72 pilot at the door and sent to Aberdeen. This version of the tank had the 57mm gun and turret. Aberdeen set about testing it, and inevitably they found things to change, which of course International Harvester and all the subcontractors had to deal with. In order to get tanks out the door, some shortcuts needed to be made. The final drives specified were herringbone gears, but International Harvester didn't have the gear shapers to make them. So the pilot vehicle rolled out with locally designed spur gears instead. There was no submission or request made to change the design, so when the gear shapers showed up, the drives would be made properly. Eventually, the first pilot was mostly built with the aid of some of the machine tools found in Rock Island Arsenal, and Continental delivered the first engine on the 25th of June, and International Harvester's Milwaukee transmission showed up on the 7th of July. With these arrivals, the first tank rolled out of the factory July 21st. Most of it. The tank didn't have a turret, but it was still good enough to run for the rest of the year and to be used for trials and experimental work. If production requirements weren't bad enough, there were also admin requirements. For example, International Harvester had their own fire truck. They also had to install and pay for an air raid warning system. I'm not quite sure who was supposed to be raiding southeastern Iowa, but they had to pay Northwestern Bell $11 for the installation of a direct line from the Davenport District Warning Center to their plant, and also a $17.50 monthly charge to maintain it. There are three levels of warning, yellow, blue, and red. If this seems a bit bad, note that this also implies that somebody was being paid to man an air raid warning center in southeast Iowa and presumably lots of other districts around the country. The Davenport Center was part of the 7th area. There was only ever one test of the system. The 9 states of 7th Service Command had a blackout at 10 p.m. to 22.20 on 14th of December 1942. Originally, they really only needed to extinguish the external lights, but they decided to see if they could do a full blackout for at least five minutes. After that, there was war production to be done, so the internal lights were turned on again for the following 15 minutes. The report from the test stated, quote, There was much work to be done in the way of providing blackout lights in the shops, separate electrical circuits for space heaters, etc., before we can be assured that we can safely undergo a blackout period of several hours. It does qualify the foregoing, though, with, quote, If such a thing ever happens. But let's go back to the summer and the problems of actually building a tank. It was not enough to merely deliver a tank. The army would not accept a tank on its own. There was also a prescribed list of spare parts, from engines to gun mounts, which had to be delivered as well at a set ratio. Unfortunately, there were a number of problems which occurred. For starters, the list of spares that the suppliers received from ordnance to be supplied to International Harvester was not identical to the list of spares that International Harvester was told to be supplied with the vehicle. So, for example, Continental would send three widgets and four watsits for the engine, where an International Harvester was expecting four widgets and three thingamajigs. Even instructions issued to the one factory did not necessarily match between instructions received from Tank Automotive Branch and the Traffic and Storage Branch. 
Part of the problem appeared to be that nobody knew who was in tank automotive branch that was responsible for the tank. Originally, as a light tank, it was in the hands of the light tank group. However, the tank was reclassified as a medium tank, and anyone who could be found to talk about the M7 was apparently more interested in the tanks which were already in production anyway. In the end, International Harvester tried to reverse the process. It came up with a list of what it thought was the good list of spare parts, what it should be, and they sent that list up to the Office of the Chief of Ordnance on the 10th of June, hoping that, since they just did the hard work, Ordnance would simply say, yep, yeah, good enough, and stamp it approved. And that's exactly what happened. On October the 23rd. But with a note saying, actually, look out for another list of spares, uh, like starters, generators, gun mounts, etc. That list never arrived, so International Harvester was never able to order them. The report concludes that International Harvester are fully on board with the whole idea of supplying tanks with spare parts, but it won't be possible to do so because of the inability to get the information concerning them. Interestingly, the priority for the first 55 tanks went from A1A to AA1, which went up, on July 17th meaning that the tank materials would be prioritized. This did not affect the priority for the tools, however. Subsequent tanks were AA2 for the next 275 and then AA3 for the next 295, a situation which remained until October 14th, when the materials for the tanks were all upgraded to AA1. Unfortunately, the urgency rating for the tooling had been dropped from 384 to 408 a month earlier, and the priority rating for the facilities, AA3. So it was really important to build the tanks, but not that important to build the factory to build the tanks. Go figure. But back to Linograph and the gun mount manufacturing. Things were working smoothly enough until on 14th of August an instruction was put out to stop working on the 57mm mounts because the army now wanted a 75mm gun on the now medium tank. Ordnance, however, was tracking the work done on the 57 and gave Linograph a choice. They could either continue with the 57mm gun project to go on to the T-48 tank destroyers, which did enter production, or they could stick with International Harvester and switch to the 75mm. The Linograph general manager, a Mr. C.E. Murray, responded, Ask International Harvester on the basis of how good a job we've done so far. International Harvester very much liked to continue with Linograph as the subcontractor for the 75mm mount. This time, Linograph was given permission to source tooling directly without having to go through International Harvester, the prime contractor, which apparently sped things up a little bit. Of 61 machine tools needed for the 75mm mount, 46 had arrived by the end of the year. Of course, they still needed to know exactly what they were building, and Ordnance was taking its time deciding which of the two possible mount concepts to go with, and then when they chose one, they made a few changes. A few working drawings were received by the 9th of September, but it was October before Linograph received the majority of the drawings that they needed. They then set to work, with 11 mounts completed by the end of the year, and 50 by the end of January 43. The gun was not the only change. As the weight got heavier, other problems occurred as well. Though Honeycutt says that the suspension on the 57mm pilot was well liked, it may have been for the ride, but not durability, as the factory report indicates that the suspension was unsatisfactory with the 57mm, and would be even worse with the 75 so that needed redesigning. So the, the steering system, designed for a much lighter vehicle, and which was, quote, extremely bad in the tested tank. The schedule said that production was to start in November 1942, but it was obvious quite some time earlier that this was not going to be feasible. For starters, ordnance kept changing the design, and several hundred new or revised drawings would show up every month. Q another two-day meeting with Tank Automotive Branch on 24th of November to please stop changing the design and freeze it. 
Oh, and there are still some drawings for some components which were never received in the first place. Most of them showed up by the end of the year, and an agreement was made to generally freeze the design. The first tank was accepted by the government 25th of November 1942 and driven across the bridge to Rock Island Arsenal. It wasn't a complete tank, but it was good enough to be shipped to Canada for cold weather testing. In December, five more more or less complete tanks were delivered. Three went to Fort Knox for armored board, one to Indio, California for desert testing, and one to the General Motors Proving Ground. They had been tested as much as possible before shipping at Bettendorf and at Rock Island Arsenal, and were believed at the time to be satisfactory vehicles. On 4th of December, there was new information. Someone in Washington had calculated that the US was starting to build more tanks than were suitable, so orders for the numbers were dropped. The Quad Cities Arsenal was originally supposed to produce 750 tanks a month. The instruction was build only 250 a month, plus the 40% spare parts, 25% first year maintenance, and 15% second year maintenance. International Harvester reconfigured its line and released whatever machine tools were no longer required for another company to receive. At this point, the Quad Cities Arsenal was running 24-7 with 1,600 employees. It not only assembled the tank, it also machined and welded the hull castings and machined the turrets, front plates and rings. I'm not quite sure what they were doing, but they obviously were churning out completed M7s. They did have 720 bogey wheels, 134 idler wheels and 613 return rollers sitting in storage waiting for tanks to be put onto. Oh, and about halfway through return roller production, French and Hecht were sent a new design. It was noted that French and Hecht could produce enough wheels to cover five tanks a day, uh, but a request was sent to Chicago Ordnance District for two Gischelt Simplematics, whatever they are. Either way, apparently with these two machines, not only could a subcontractor build as many wheels as needed for the tank plant, it would do so at a savings to the government of $32 per tank. The machines never showed up. It is worth noting though that the production of hulls did continue uh, because there are photographs of certainly more than seven on the line. Of course, things didn't improve. Armored Force started testing the M7s early in the year, 43, and it didn't perform anywhere near as well in testing as the M4A3. The M7 lacked sufficient power to pull itself out of holes, plus drivers couldn't really get their heads around the way the new tank drove over the short test period, resulting in a very unfavorable opinion of the tank. They noted that the top speed of the tank was actually a little bit higher than necessary, so in order to help with the obstacle problem, they instructed that the gearing ratios be changed in the transfer case, subconverter gears, and that the drive sprockets be reduced by one tooth, 14 to 13. They also insisted on a change to the torque converter and much lighter track suspension castings were required. A few other changes were made as well, plus a new engine design gave it a bit more torque, but in the meantime, it seems the production lines in Bettendorf just kept on ticking, as photo dated March of 43. The modified tank reportedly slightly outperformed the M4A3, but unfortunately, coming in at more or less the same weight and firepower as the Sherman, there seemed to be no particular point in fielding it. So the contract was terminated with the six pilots and seven production vehicles accepted. Which of course meant that everyone involved has just wasted a year and a half and now has to find something else to do. In the end, Quad Cities Arsenal got contracts for Sherman refurbishing, amongst other things. So hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the joys of making a place to make a tank. Hope you found it interesting and informative. I'll talk to you next time. Take care.